initially my 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 goal was to somewhat present to you um, a range of things that we've worked on and i i think that i will try and do that towards the end of the talk but at the same time i thought it would be potentially useful to give my perspective as a an experimentalist because in the end this is what really my lab does uh, who's worked a lot to try and understand the brain and brains in general uh, and who's worked a lot with uh, modelers and theorists and to say a bit about what i've learned through these collaborations about the difficulties in bridging the gap between experiment and 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 more theoretical approaches and i think it's still a work in progress i think it's difficult and i think that there are um, fundamental issues about experimental neuroscience and about biology that theorists also need to understand um, to apply uh, their approaches to experimental neuroscience so i'll try and illustrate some of these things and go through them so um the kinds of systems that we've worked on uh, over the past uh, now 30 years or so uh, cover a range of of systems of animal uh, species and uh, systems and the stuff that really interests me is is the dynamics of neural systems so on the left you see some stuff that summarizes a bit of the work we've done on olfaction in insects as Christoph was saying at the moment, we're working on uh, a problem of texture ma matching, something that cephalopods do when they camouflage. It's a fascinating behavior that implies uh, a perception of texture that's similar to that of their predators, including us. So uh, an example of, of convergent evolution that's fascinating. We're also working on sleep now using reptiles as model systems. And those are fascinating systems. I'll, I'll say a bit more towards the end. And then on the right, some um, results that we've had recently on dynamics within visual cortex, and in particular, the observation that the activation of a single neuron can generate a sequence of firing in a whole population of neurons in a, in a, in a very specific manner that's repeatable. And I'll, I'll, I'll give you a few examples towards the end. So all these are vignettes of the kinds of things that we do, but they all... Um, illustrate some aspect of, of dynamics of neural circuits so here is the outline of what i'd like to talk about I'll give you my my perspective as a biologist working on these um, type of, of systems um, stating and trying to illustrate that the interaction between theory and experiment um, in neuroscience is, is particularly difficult um, explain what I think by there is no such thing as the brain, um, illustrate aspects about the complexity and the reason for this complexity, talk about evolution. We need to understand that a brain is a result of evolution to be able to tackle it. Um, and then what our tasks should be as both experimentalists and theorists um, to describe, to simplify, to understand. And in the end, the biggest challenging challenges us to uh, are to bridge the gap between what we do and what many of you do so um what i'll say first is that over the years what i've learned um is that the brain is extremely complex in in such a way that um illustrate the fact that we're still extremely data poor and by my observation that theory is not at a state that can predict much about the way a system works and none of the systems that we've worked on uh, were based on the search for evidence for things that had been predicted by by theory all of it was surprising all of it was unexpected and as a result interesting and i'd say that at the level of theory uh, it is extremely rare that it predicts anything that we discover still today about the brain. So that's simply to illustrate the fact that I think we are at a very, very early stage of neuroscience, especially experimental neuroscience. Um, that's not to say, of course, that theory is not important, it's critical, but um, that's that's my, my, my feeling. So the things I'm going to say, some, some of them are somewhat provocative and, and facetious in a way, but that's just a, a means to trigger conversation and so on, nothing else. I, I, it's, uh, 
I'm not saying that theory is not needed, it is, and it's uh, essential. So, when I say, for example, that uh, theory is at an early stage, and when I hear my theorist friends say that and complain that biologists don't know any mathematics and are ignorant in many of the quantitative aspects that are needed, I'd say that that's true. Uh, I'm guilty of that too, but at the same time, I don't think that that's the major problem at this point. Uh, I think we're very early on both theoretical and, and experimental sides. I'd say also that I'm not sure we really know what it would mean to understand that we know what it would mean to really understand a brain or a piece of brain. I think it's actually a, a deep question. When would we know that we've basically understood a system? I think there are very few examples where we can get a hint of that. And some of them come from insect neuroscience that are very recent. For example, in the head direction system, uh, where you can have a really good description of the biology, the network, the connectivity, the dynamics, and then have a, an overall perspective of what the system does, what the computations are, and how it's implemented. There are very few systems that I can think of where we have that level of, of understanding that essentially allows one to predict. So, why is this task that we have so complex? And there's of course a number of reasons, most of which you know already. The first one is that when we talk about the brain, it's of course a complicated organ that's not a single thing, but a collection of specialized and evolved systems and circuits that do different things. So these are two illustrations of what we are starting to learn about connectivity within the mouse brain on the left and the fly brain on the right. And um, what we discover is that there is tremendous complexity in interactions, circuits, structure, graphs, but there's also ama amazing order within it. And um, in a way which, which uh, diverges completely from, from uh, randomness. So circuits are extremely complex, um, distributed, uh, but ordered. And, and we're just starting to get good illustrations of this from uh, biological data. Um, a second reason is, of course, um, that the brains are, as a result of being complex and complicated and made on many elements, is that um, they have properties that cannot be derived from the knowledge of their components. And that's what was beautifully explain in, in uh, Phil Anderson's paper in 72, more is different. Um, the existence of interactions between elements lead to new laws, new properties, emergent properties that cannot, cannot be derived from the components. And these are things that are um, every day discovered as we look at, at, uh, at the brain. A second thing is that brains are the result of li living systems. They're a byproduct of evolution. And life has been going on on our planet for nearly as long as the planet has existed. Life uh, defined in the simplest way as self-replicating molecules have probably existed for four billion years. Eukaryotes are cells with a nucleus for nearly three billion years. And nervous systems for 600 billion years. But all the components of nervous systems, all the components of neurons and synapses and so on were invented way before there existed even neurons, but even less nervous systems, connections between neurons. The molecular components of a synapse are ones that you can find in sponges that don't have a nervous system. You can even find them in unicellular organisms such as coenoflagellates. Um, so, the evolution and the invention of, of brains and nervous systems is the, the result of cooptation of existing systems, molecules that were invented by evolution to do other things. So in a sense, the thought about optimization of design of a brain 
um, has to take into account the fact that it's uh, the result of a, an accretion of invention and a co-optation of already existing things. There is no uh, tabula rasa possible in evolution. You don't start again from scratch because you realize that you're in a dead end. It's uh, basically you have to build with what you have. So that's one aspect. Um, another one is that, of course, it results, uh, brains result from evolution, which is a process, a process of natural selection, of adaptation. There's a closed loop that essentially decides whether to keep or not to keep. And then adaptation that exploits niches that uh, enable a system to spatiate and, and, and form a new lineage. So it's a, it's a progressive complexification based on what uh, already existed. And then it's a system that has emergent properties and those are uh, actually quite complex to uh, come to grips with. Some of them, of course, are what we call behavior, sort of motor things, and that's how the brain evolved, presumably initially as to, to move an organism towards a source of food. Um, and that, in parallel, required sensing of the environment. But there are things that are much more difficult to understand from a scientific uh, point of view, which are also emergent properties of the brain, which are what we call perceptions, emotions. There's no real way of understanding why red feels like red or why a smell smells like it does or why what an emotion is and so on from a purely computational neural objective point of view. Uh, these are properties that emerge from the design of nervous systems that we have knowledge about through our own subjective experience, but that presumably exist as well in other creatures and that must be part of the way in which nervous systems are designed. So in a sense, uh, understanding circuit properties or neural properties or computational properties um, without putting that in uh, may prevent us from understanding why things are the way they are completely. I'm not saying that we need to understand everything, but uh, some of the features, some of the emergent properties of nervous system that we practically ignore uh, may actually be very important uh, to allow us to understand how, how brains are, are put together. So, um, another aspect um, that is important is um, that we often, when we study sensory systems, for example, have uh, often discussions about um, uh, optimality and, and the desire for uh, thinking about the brain as generating some kind of rational and optimized output. Um, but these issues are actually themselves extremely difficult to think about once you think about brains as being the result of evolution. The optimization itself cannot be thought of outside of a process of selection. Um, and so um, the space of features that we typically think about when we think about optimality of sensory systems, say, um, I think has to be put in a much larger context of evolution, adaptation, natural selection. And that somewhat changes our perspective. And I think that's important. I return to evolution here. I was saying that the evolution of the components of the brain of, is, is very ancient, uh, many billion years. But brains as systems of neurons have probably existing, existed for um, six to seven hundred million years. Uh, they're the result of an evolution that you see here on the bottom graph uh, that has led to a wide variety of, of lineages with um, a set of very critical periods, such as, for example, the Cambrian explosion that has led to an enormous diversification of body plans and presumably uh, brain plans as well. We study uh, cephalopods in my lab and uh, reptiles, and they uh, represent something like 600 million years of, uh, of divergence, of independent evolution uh, from systems that are made of the same elements. Uh, in fact, everything we know about the action potential nearly started with uh, work on the giant axon, which is a cephalopod. Uh, 
But the nervous systems them themselves are, are built along rules that are very different. At least they look completely different. Um, and yet, the brain of an octopus contains about a half a billion neurons, which is as big as the brain of a, of a squirrel. It accomplishes tasks that are amazingly complex, just as the ones that we or other mammals can solve. And yet, from a common ancestor that lacked any of these properties. So, in other words, that the result of convergence, and this is extremely interesting, uh, because it implies that there are certain forces that enable systems to arrive at particular solutions that are probably in great part imposed by the fact that these systems operate in the same world with the same physics, the same statistics, the same basic properties. And those must have very strong influence on um, the design principles and the solution, the solutions that can be arrived at. So, you may get the sense <clears throat> for what kind of school I am from. I am basically from the school of uh, brains as being big bags of tricks, um, made up of millions of different elements that have been co-opted through evolution. And as a result of a particular history um, to accomplish what they can. And um, brains are not designed by normalien or field medalists that have some idea about what needs to be done. They're really the, the result of, of, of a long process of trial and error and selection. And if you think about evolution itself, what's fascinating is that people have estimated the number of species that have uh, existed since the beginning of, of life. And I don't know how one arrives at this number, but uh, people estimate this number to be about 4 billion species. And more than 99% of those have disappeared through a number of extinctions, the most recent one being caused by us humans. Um, but many body plans and presumably many nervous system plans have disappeared and we'll never know about them. And they probably operated quite well, except at some time there was a singularity in the evolution of our planet that led to their extinction, such as dinosaurs, for example. I'll get back now to theory and, and to try and, and address the issue that concerns me as an experimentalist and what I think theory and modeling should be here for to help us understand and make sense of all this. And of course, I, I, I see things uh, relatively simply. First, as a help to describe, as a way to simplify those descriptions, and as a way to define understanding. And so I'll first talk about description itself and return to biology. One feature about experimental biology, which uh, most of you theorists must be irritated by, is how complicated things are and how unable we experimentalists are. Um, to make it simpler. <laughs> and this is uh, particularly true of neuroscience today with the evolution of a number of new techniques, in particular molecular techniques that enable us to describe things in greater and greater detail. So I'll, I'll take the example of neuronal diversity. It started many decades ago with a purely anatomical uh, descriptions first of you know layers and and uh, the structure of of gross histology then the anatomy of individual neural types etc cetera, etc cetera. and more recently through uh, the development of techniques that are called transcriptomics that is uh, the sequencing of rnas that uh, allow us to identify the cells that are expressed by individual cells uh, enable us to identify neuronal cell types molecularly through their molecular identity. So we do a sequencing of, uh, I don't know, as many genes as we can, say 10,000, and then identify clusters of, uh, of expression of RNA, of mRNAs, that identify clusters of cell types that are defined molecularly. And as we do so, in this example, which is um, something that comes, I pulled out of the Allen uh, uh, 
brain map, the Allen Institute uh, Atlas. You can see that in the mouse, in the mouse brain, we can identify several hundred different cell types. It's absolutely scary. How will we ever make sense of this mess? What is important about this? Um, you can focus on cells that express GABA, which will be interneurons, and you find 50 types. And you can look at those clusters and identify within them uh, groups of particular genes that are called transcription factors that identify big families of interneurons. And with this, you can somewhat simplify things. This is what this panel shows, that in the end, you can simplify this description to something a lot lower dimensional in the sense with four main groups of interneuron types. And so we learn a lot in the past few years, we've learned a lot about these four main groups that are characterized by certain proteins or neuropeptides that they express. And each one of these families has different cell types within them that all differ from one another in a very specific manner. Molecular, but not only molecular, those things are correlated with the way in which, for example, they connect to targets or to inputs. And we discover through this that the connectivity that they form, the circuits that they uh, define, are extremely precise. A particular cell type, say a PV interneuron that you see here, is connected, receives input from a certain subtype of other interneurons and connects to pyramidal cells in a particular position of those cells themselves. And those details are not random. Those graphs are not random. They are very precisely organized. So we're in a stage now, in the coming years, we'll basically uh, be in a position to describe, I think, a lot of that detail. And the task will be to try and figure out what is important about these details from what is not important. And what I describe here is what concerns the mouse, about which we probably know the most. But parallel uh, efforts, for example, in humans, and looking at the human transcriptome, show the same thing with great similarities with the mouse, but differences that are human-specific or ones that are mouse-specific. And you can even go back in evolution and do the same thing. So that's something that my lab does in part, like many others, by looking at the brain of reptiles. And when you do so, and you compare the brain and the transcriptome of a reptile to that of a mouse, you found that in the case of interneurons, which is what you see here, is that the main families of, of interneurons are basically the same in a reptile. And the reptiles and the mammals diverged 320 million years ago. So clearly these features and these big families of cell types are inherited from common ancestry that dates at least um, half of the lifetime of nervous systems, and probably more. People are not doing the same thing with amphibians and fish, and will soon have the full evolutionary history of these systems. So it's not new, it's inherited. The different lineages have diversified each one of these subfamilies into different cell types, and the more detail you get, the more you see that those diverge in very specific manners. And that leads us to ask, well, what's important about this? How, how do we make sense of this in a way which, uh, which allows us to understand at least one brain? Which one should we choose? These are some of the big problems, I think, that, that we need to, to tackle. And I think that comparative work will be extremely important in this, in helping us understand what's important and what's not. Um, some other aspects that are important and, and I think frustrating uh, to those who would like to simplify. So many of them have to have, have something to do with, with the, the complexity of doing and gathering data in experimental neuroscience. So one aspect, for example, is variation. Um, practically speaking, honestly speaking, the way in which we sample brains uh, is extremely poor. I mean, think about the history of systems neuroscience. You have 50 years of sampling one neuron at a time to try and make sense of a system that contains millions of cells. It's gone quite far that way. Uh, but clearly, uh, 
we cannot understand something by looking at it one piece at a time. Um, now the the front end, if you will, the cutting edge of experimental neuroscience at sampling the activity of neurons uh, enables people to record up to about a million neurons at uh, 15 samples per second using three photon imaging on various uh, planes in cortical areas in mouse. So now we've gone from data sets that are one neuron to something that approaches a million and it's great, except we have new problems, which is how to make sense of those million time series, uh, uh, trying to map onto this the anatomical detail that I was telling you about a slide ago. So new problems and uh, extremely complex ones. The second aspect is, is variation. And variation can be due to many different factors that are biological. <coughs> <clears throat> can be developmental stage, can be age, can be sex, can be brain state. As we learn more and more about brain states, we see that things vary a lot. Can be sleep or wake state, but it can be different substates of sleep or different substates of wake state. Depressed, fearful, all these different features that we know that are sort of high level, but that of course have an influence on the way in which systems work. We have circadian clocks that we're starting to understand, but that clearly have very strong influences on the way nervous systems work. Um, duration of the day, uh, latitude that a system is at, etc. All these things have effects on the brain, and we typically completely ignore those things. So these generate variations um, that are sort of hidden in our data sets. I think we need to take care about these issues. Of course, when we try and describe systems, we would like to be at steady state. It's very difficult to make sense of a system which is not at steady state. And then we have to define what a steady state is. And that in and of itself is complicated because systems and nervous systems operate over huge uh, um, dynamic ranges where things can be important at the millisecond uh, scale as well as the minute scale, as well as the hour scale, as well as the day scale. And all of these features and all these time scales are nested within one another. Again, in ways that we very often do not keep track uh, of. And, um, and these are, are problems that you know, we experimentalists often think about, but don't do much about because it's complicated experimentally. We'd want to have these steady state conditions so that we can identify these invariances, which in the end, I think, is what we're looking for. Um, it's difficult. So, um, with this, I'm kind of moving towards um, what I think we're all after is to try and from the analysis of these data sets and the use of theories to arrive at what we call abstract principles that uh, might describe what's going on. And there I'd like to give a, another example, which I think is, is, a, is an interesting illustration of, of what one of these principles could be. So we're all familiar with Hodgkin and Huxley, their equations and their description of um, the action potential, the different ionic fluxes going through the membrane and so on. Uh, a decade ago, um, in the lab of uh, uh, Gerald Shrell in, uh, in San Diego, uh, a beautiful study was published that describes um, what happens in um, populations, very large populations of bacteria that form biofilms, so they're two-dimensional populations of bacteria that live on the surface of water at this interface between water and air. And they can form enormous populations of, of millions to billions of cells. And um, an apparent consequence of this uh, organization, physical organization of the system, is that the access to nutrient varies a lot depending on where you sit within that population. And nutrients are accessible to those on the periphery and much less to those in the center. 
And the consequence of this is that the population has to somewhat figure out how to uh, make available nutrients to these uh, um, elements of the population that have little access to them. And that requires some coordination across the population. And that coordination takes the form of electrical signals that are carried by potassium flux through uh, the bacterial membrane. And that, that potassium flux then generates a potential difference that can be recorded and measured with different techniques that can be electrical, can be optical. And when they did so, they observed that the population seems to operate by providing signals that are essentially all or none, very much like the action potential across the population that propagate from one individual to the next, one bacterium to the next, except that the duration of each one of these spikes, instead of being on the millisecond range, is about half an hour. So a completely different time scale, but the nature of the signal is in a way very similar to that of the action potential, except in a different regime. So I like to call this some kind of a functional convergence in a sense, sort of invention of a proto nervous system and neural interneural communication by bacterial populations in a way which reminds us, of course, of nervous systems. Um, and one would like to call this some kind of a principle of communication across nervous system like systems. But of course, one has to ask whether that really is a principle. Is this the right interpretation? Are we looking at communication in exactly the same way? Is a propagating wave the way, uh, an appropriate description of the way in which nervous systems operate? Of course not. The connection graphs in true nervous systems completely different, non-local, etc. So if you're forced to think about what the principle might be, you have to you have to be self-critical and you have to figure out what are the features that define a principle. And I think that these are some of the questions that are, to me, most interesting when thinking about comparisons, when thinking about nervous systems, when thinking about principles. And I think this is where theorists are really important in defining what would be a principle. I don't know as an experimentalist, I describe, I, I'm in awe of the complexity and the beauty of the systems, but I'd like to figure out how we can identify out of that uh, principles that are common to them, that make sense. Uh, some of the last few things I want to talk about, simplification, understanding, and bridging the gap. So simplification obvious, uh, obviously is what we're all after. I think we, maybe not everybody in the audience agrees, but the the human brain project type of, of modeling and, and, and simulation is probably not the kind of thing that will help us simplify and understand. Um, and so there are many different approaches, and, and um, some of them will use, uh, you know, low-dimensional description of neurons, etc. With different approaches and, and levels of simplification, going to dynamical system theory and, and yet other abstract, abstract approaches. All of those are important in the process. Um, the question is, what are the approaches that one should use? And there I go to a, a quote that I really like from Jaco Frankel, who is a, a physicist, condensed matter physicist, um, that, that said the following thing, which I read here, uh, trying to figure out how one models the complexity of, of, of physics, of experimental physics. And he said, a good theoretical model of a complex system should be like a good caricature. It should emphasize those features which are most important and should downplay the inessential details. Now, the only snag with this advice is that one does not really know which are the inessential details until one has understood the phenomena under study. Consequently, one should investigate a wide range of models and not stake one's life or one's theoretical insight on one particular model only. So this is, I think, where, I mean, it's a critical point, and this is where the act of simplifying and the act of understanding are basically the two same things, or two sides of the same coin. They have to go in parallel. 
we don't really know how to simplify before we know what it means to understand. And so these two things have to be tackled together. And that also means that the act of simplifying through theory has to be experimental at some degree, at least for me. I think that it's difficult to imagine forcing a particular theoretical approach until you really know where you want to go. And so that makes our tasks, that of experimentalists and theorists, somewhat parallel and, and equivalent in a way. We have to play. We have to be modest about what, what we can, the techniques that we can use, okay? So um, now I'm, I'm basically reaching the end and I just want to give you and return to what I was supposed to talk about at the very beginning is to give you uh, uh, vignettes about what we do in the lab and the kinds of, of problems that we work on and which are the things that I would very much like to talk about in, in the course in, in the spring in, in Paris uh, in whatever detail is deemed interesting. And now I'll talk about, uh, I don't know, three or four examples, and I go very quickly and I'll just summarize. The first one is work that we've done uh, in the past when, when my lab was at Caltech, and that focused on olfactory systems and the dynamics of olfactory systems. So uh, we worked on mostly insects, and the insect olfactory system is, is beautiful. It's formed of an antenna that has a bunch of uh, receptor neurons that uh, transduce a signal um, from odorant molecules, sends it to a very small neuropil, a very small structure that contains about a thousand neurons. So there's a massive convergence from the array of receptors to this structure. And this is a structure that has amazing dynamics that is so interesting. And then out of that thousand neurons, then you have divergence to a very large structure that's involved in forming odor memories, that's called the mushroom bodies, that has, you know, order a hundred more cells in it. And what we did over the years is to try and understand the dynamics of that structure. And because the circuit is feed forward with essentially no feedback from the mushroom body to the antenna lobe, understand the way in which these patterns coming out of the antenna lobe are decoded by the cells in the mushroom body. And we, we got quite far in understanding a lot of aspects of this decoding. But what I want to focus on here very briefly and with very schematic description is what we learned about the, the antenna lobe and that structure. So I said there's a thousand neurons roughly. Think about a representation of an odor as an n-dimensional vector in, uh, in the space defined by those cells. They're not all independent, so n is not a thousand, but let's say it's a 300 or whatever it is. And an odor is going to be activating a subset of these neurons. In fact, typically about 50% of them. So it's a very dense representation. But that vector will vary over time. So the pattern of activation of these neurons will change from one fraction of a second to the next in a very systematic way that's stimulus specific. So you can plot this raster, which is the result of recording from a series of groups of neurons. So here about 110 into a vector then projected in these two dimensions. But as I was telling you that activity varies over time and therefore this vector defines a trajectory and that trajectory represents the the representation of, of that odor by that population of neurons. Now superimposed on this, what we call transient, is an oscillation that's generated by local interneurons that defines time into adjacent time bins of about 50 millisecond duration. And the update of this population vector is done at each cycle of this oscillation. So you go from one particular binary vector where each cell fires zero or once to an X1, to an X1, to an X1, defining that trajectory. So the representation of an odor for a particular puff of an odor will be this trajectory. You present it a second time, it's a second trial for an experiment list, 
And what you observe then is that you define a new trajectory, which is similar to the first one, but not exactly because there is some noise and variations in the response of individual cells. You now play with the stimulus in such a way that you vary their concentration. So you use the same odor, but vary the concentration. And what you observe then is that it defines a family of such trajectories that define some low dimensional manifold within that phase space. So that all the odors, but across all these concentrations now are represented by, by this low dimensional structure within it. So this is a schematic, but this is true projection from true data that represent different concentrations of the same odor. So you now present another odor, completely different one, chemically, present different concentrations of that second odor, and you define a new manifold. So odor representation now is within that phase space carried by these low dimensional manifolds that each correspond to a different chemical uh, with a family of concentration representations. The way in which we do these experiments in the lab is by puffing odors for a long time, let's say a few hundred milliseconds on, 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 on the animal's antenna. But in the real world, odors don't exist in this way. They're pulsatile. They're basically carried by fluid, air or water, depending on where the animal lives. And they're cut up into little filaments such that you get this sort of pulsatile stimuli. So under these conditions, how do the responses look? Or what do they look like? This is what you see here. They live within these manifolds, but they move around in ways that intersect these different trajectories that correspond to different concentrations. So the experiment, the clean experiment that we do in the lab allows us to define those manifolds, but in real conditions, the odor representation sort of moves around on these manifolds. So this is the response to one odor, this is the response to another odor with the same set of neurons recorded in each case. So now I was telling you that uh, we we're doing these experiments with uh, odor pulses that last a few hundred milliseconds. And when Ofer Mazor was in the, the lab, he was doing experiments, in fact, with even longer odor pulses. And when you just saw what you observe is that when the odor pulse is as long as a couple of seconds, the systems then stops evolving and reaches something like a fixed point. You can keep the odor on for five seconds, 10 seconds, and this odor vector stops evolving. And when you turn the stimulus off, the system returns to the baseline state, but doesn't relax back following the on transient, but moves back to the baseline following a different trajectory. You present a different odor, the same thing obtains, except you reach a different fixed point through a different transient. And when you compare the representation of these two odors during the transient or during the fixed point, what you observe is that the discriminability of these vectors is much greater during the transient than it is during when the system reaches its fixed point. In other words, from a, a, a decoder's point of view, the discrimination of the two stimuli is done better when the system is in motion than when it's at its fixed point. The second aspect is that in reality, the system in biology never reaches the fixed point simply because odor stimuli are pulsatile and very brief. So the dynamics of the system define this particular portrait here. But in reality, that fixed point is never reached. So that's interesting. It means that there's something, some underlying dynamics within the network that reach that fixed point, but in fact, it's never used by the system. So when we we're doing this experimental uh, work, we um, got in touch with um, friends and colleagues at, at San Diego, uh, Misha Rabinovich being one of them, Henry Barbanel and so on, who are physicists involved in dynamical systems. And they got extremely interested in the kinds of dynamics that were uh, a finding. And so they started looking at this and these particular portraits of activity and, and generated some simplified models that might explain these kinds of dynamics with particular 
forms of equations that are classical in this field, particular topology, and particular connectivity, in particular, the existence of asymmetric uh, connectivity within the network was critical. And when they did so, they could obtain dynamics that look very much like the ones that we observe, in the sense that we have basically a system that hops between unstable saddle points, defining trajectories along the edges here that link all these unstable points, but forming what they call heteroclinic orbits that are reliable and input specific. And so these represent things that very much look like and behave like the system that we observe. So that was extremely interesting. And these approaches have been taken on by a few others. I, I cite here this uh, uh, particular paper, but there's a number of them. And now the problem, the problem that I as an experimentalist have with this approach, which is not a problem. I think it's wonderful to have this sort of description, which is simplified and somewhat could explain. But the problem is that I don't see that we can prove or disprove that this description is appropriate for the system that we study. Basically, uh, measuring Lyapunov exponent out of the experimental system that we have requires time series and data sets that we cannot obtain, just too big, not possible. And so the problem is, how do we possibly bridge that gap that separates us from the experiment? And this to me is, is one of the most frustrating and complicated questions that I'd like to find eventually an answer to. Where do we go from there? We have a beautiful theory. We have data that are incomplete. And we want to figure out whether the first describes the second or doesn't. And I feel that we're stuck. So that's one of the issues. Second example. Um, let me take all this stuff out. I was telling you that we study reptilian cortex, and that's a completely different topic, of course. Uh, our strategy was to try and understand cortical dynamics by studying an ancient cortex. Reptiles are the only vertebrates that have a, a simplified cortex that has only three layers, very much like hippocampus or, or piriform cortex. And again, fortuitously, when we're doing experiments, trying to measure connectivity within the network, Mike Hamburger, who was a grad student in the lab at the time, observed that when he injected current in a single pyramidal cell, while recording from hundreds of cells in parallel in that same cortex, observe that the injection of current in one cell to produce a single spike or a couple of spikes then generates this sequential activation of a specific subset of neurons. So these are different examples that you can see. And you can repeat this over and over again, and you'll get a sequence of spikes in a specific set of identifiable pyramidal and uh, pyramidal cells and interneurons. With uh, Luis Riquelme and our colleague, who's now moved, um, um, Juliana Georgieva, uh, we built a model of this system using all the parameters of connectivity and biophysics that we had data on of these total cortex. Uh, with um, the same numbers of cells that we were basically recording from, about 100,000 that we could sample over a square millimeter of cortex. And the beauty of this system, of course, is that we can now look at the graph of connectivity because we have it. It's built in the model. And we could observe in these kinds of, uh, of, of experiments the noise that was generated by uh, uh, providing noise, independent noise in, in individual cells within the network, and observe the same kind of variability from one trial to the next uh, in the sequential activation of postsynaptic cells. And by zooming in on the graph and the connectivity of these cells, we could observe that this noise was in fact linked to the state of a few key neurons that essentially act as gates between subnetworks 
that represent subgroups of cells that can be activated either together or independently of one another. So this kind of experiment and modeling using realistic connectivity revealed the possibility of gating and uh, forcing connection um, across subsets of that network extremely interesting i think uh, from the point of view of understanding a, a visual cortex in particular and these are the kinds of things that i'd be very happy to talk about thanks very much i'm i'm very happy to take a question and discuss now so i have a very naive question so uh let me get the example you gave the system so you have a, one side the half a plot and then a kind of um, trajectory at the name of system, which was deduced from them. But after you said that the problem with this model, that uh, you miss enough data to, to estimate the, the coefficients uh, and so on. Yeah. So I, I don't understand how did you get the picture if you don't have enough data? So uh, the, the, you, we, 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 can, we can get this picture uh, with the data that we have we cannot um, prove this particular approach and this particular model of dynamics because the dynamics requires a knowledge of these exponents that can only be estimated from much larger data sets than we can obtain experimentally. So the description that I showed is, is accurate. This is a projection after very simple uh, uh, transformations of the data sets. But the connection and parallel that you can draw between the theory and the results that we have is purely morphological. It's not theoretical. It cannot be proved uh, at this point. It could potentially, if we had infinite data sets, and we could define the dynamics of the system by figuring out you know what the dominating exponents are but we can't so i yes. have a question on the uh, olfactory uh, manifolds that you talked about you said that there are these manifolds that are represents it's let's say a model of the the others that the animals can perceive in the environment but when you present in naturalistic uh, environments the others, they don't, you don't see the whole manifold. You only see a small portion yeah. that doesn't even that. Yeah. But then in the environment, I would expect the animals to have some action over what the smells. They could go back to a particular interesting smell and getting mm -hmm. more, and getting more, well, a, uh, more time. Yeah, more samples, mm -hmm. exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You would expect them to actually explore most of this manifold if they deemed important or interesting. Very true. Very true. So, in fact, this so, is what you observe. That that when and so we when we detect an odor and find it interesting, we we sniff uh, a lot of animals as mammals in particular uh, have olfaction that's coupled with respiration. So we sniff and if you look at a dog or a rat, they sniff at accelerated uh, rates uh, when they detect something that might be interesting and in, indeed these are successive samples insects do it differently it's not coupled with respiration but they have antennae and they can move their antennae and so they, they just basically cross the filament with this and they repeat samples and they do exactly what you're saying sort of uh, exploring that manifold and and these repeated samples are then being decoded by the station that's postsynaptic to this and again, increasing the sampling through that decoding. So yeah, I, it, I, I totally agree with you. Uh, and do you expect them to to achieve the the stable, the not stable, but the attracting point? No. By this behavior, mm -hmm. not you don't get to that. Is this too uh, a sample of the manifold when they do? They still contain in this. Uh, so, you know, the, the, the end goal is to identify an odor or to encode it in such a way that you can identify it later. 
So basically, it's the, the goal one is to form a memory and to have enough samples that you can encode that odor in a set of neurons that will be specific for it that are located in the mushroom body and through a process that we sort of understand. Uh, or if you've already experienced it and it's an odor that's useful, to recognize it by the activation of that subset of cells that have learned that odor. That's the end goal. But the, the fixed point itself doesn't appear to be important for the process. It's maybe important for the dynamics in the sense that the design of the circuit imposes the existence of that fixed point, but it's itself not really being used. You, you made a beautiful point for comparative approaches. And, and in the 70s and 80s, um, a lot of people were using this kind of approach. Mm -hmm. And it disappeared um, slowly during the 90s. And now, I mean, about your lab and very few of the ones, I mean, uh, it's not, not represented anymore. Well, it's, uh, you clearly showed that it's necessary. Um, so, I mean, what can we do? I mean, it's, the, the point is, it's very hard to get money if you're saying, well, guys, I want to, to study the brain of cephalopods. Uh, <laughs> so, how, how can, we, can we bring that back to the, to the, I, the I, point? I, I am optimistic. Yeah, no, I mean, it's a very good point, and, and, but I'm optimistic, and I think it's coming back. I think thanks to molecular techniques, uh, transcriptomics, genomics, uh, CRISPR, I think that people are increasing, increasingly um, able to use interesting model systems um, in ways that approach uh, what you can do in, in the classical model systems that people use in experimental neuroscience, like genetic models typically, the mouse, the fly, uh, C. elegans and to some extent zebrafish. Um, so I think that I, I'm optimistic. I'm seeing more and more people uh, working on this system, simply exploiting the uh, advantages, for example, in, in behavior that they might have. Um, I, I'm in New York at the moment and I'm visiting labs and I see a number of labs that are working on things that I would never have expected them to do uh, 10 years ago. So I think that there's, there's, uh, we're on a, a positive slope and think things are, are moving in the right direction. Uh, whether study sections and, and um, committees that award grants will are ready yet, I don't know, but uh, hopefully they will if, uh, if enough of us work on them. <laughs>